think you're ever gonna. Sixties cult. You will go to the moon. That was the promise of that kids book. That I, that in my lifetime, there'd be cities on the moon. There'd be tourism to the moon. Now here I sit in my early forties, and there hasn't been anybody on the moon for thirty years. I go and talk to school classes today. And I tried to talk to kids about how exciting it was to grow up with the space program as a backdrop. And one of the things that a kid said to me that just sort of blew me away was, well, yeah, it's all well and good. You were nine years old when uh, they were walking on the moon. When I was a kid, my first memory of the space program was the space shuttle Challenger exploding. And I wonder about that, the effect it has on kids today. I grew up at the right time to be fascinated by space exploration. I don't think kids today are fascinated by it. And I suspect we'll see not a crop of science fiction writers coming out of today's kids because science doesn't astonish them and amaze them and have breakthroughs happening every day that are fascinating just for being breakthroughs. They all they hear about is science telling you this will cause you cancer, that'll cause you cancer, this will uh, bring down the downfall of our moral structure if we go ahead with cloning. They hear negative, negative, negative. In the 60s, it was positive, and it very much influenced me as a writer. I wanted to write about the positive impact that science was going to have on humanity, because it never even occurred to me growing up in the 60s that there was any other kind of impact that it could have. There are two kinds of people in life. There are those who like to have their home reflective of what they do for a living, and there are those who like to have nothing whatsoever to do with what they do for a living at home. Well, I'm in the former category. I'm a science fiction writer, and long before that, I was a science fiction fan. So I've got some Star Trek stuff here. I'm also a big dinosaur fan. I've got my uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex model there right in the uh, little food preparation area. Uh, we've got a calendar that shows astronomical stuff on the kitchen. Uh, it's, it's my home, but science fiction and astronomy and science, that's my life as well. And I, since I work out of my home, I surround myself with it in every room. I sit here in a lazy boy chair to do my writing. I like to be relaxed. I think if a writer is going to spend most of his life at the keyboard, the days when you had to have that hunched over the little uh, manual typewriter are mercifully long gone. I got a cordless keyboard. I can put it anywhere. Cordless mouse, comfy chair. In the middle of the afternoon, if I need a nap, I'm all set. I can just even have my nap without getting up. I got my caffeine and sugar uh, right here. The phone, but the most important thing on the phone is the call display, because unless it's my agent or my editor during business hours, Carolyn answers it, or if she's not in, the answering machine gets it. I don't want to be disturbed by family, friends, or strangers in particular, of course, when I'm trying to get my work done. Uh, I got an intercom here where I can call uh, Carolyn in her office, which is farther along the hall here if I need to. And mostly, I've just got things that make me cheerful and happy to be in this room. I love, uh, I love fossils and so forth, so I've got a big Archaeopteryx fossil on the wall over there. Uh, I love the old science fiction TV shows, and I've got a Fireball XL5 model up there from 1963 is when that show was on the air. Uh, I've been writing about Neanderthals a lot lately. My current trilogy is about a parallel world where Neanderthals survived the present day, and we did not, so I've got Neanderthal skulls spattered, uh, scattered about the room to keep me happy. And I'm a bit of a, a technophilic kind of guy. I love gadgets and machines. I think there's one, two, I think there are five computers in this room here, and I use them all at different times of uh, my writing cycle. This is the comfy chair, but I've got an old-fashioned laptop that's terrible in dark rooms, but perfect in bright sunlight. It's got a passive screen. The more light on it, the better. I go out of my balcony. There's a door right out here onto my balcony and a nice uh, lounge chair out there where I can sit in the summer and do my writing. It's just the whole thing is designed to make this the most comfortable place in the house so that I won't constantly be looking for reasons to escape from, you know, the garret that writers are supposed to write in. I'm very much at home here, and I can spend just hours and hours creating at this keyboard. There is a place in your life for what I call para-writing activities, P-E-P-A-R-A, -E para, like writing activities, but it can't be your whole life. It is good to come into uh, a workshop. It is good to give a talk. 
It is good to give a reading. It may be good to be involved in, in a, a writer's organization. But none of those things are actually writing. And at the end of each day, you should sit down and ask yourself, what did I do today that was writing? Not what did I do today that was like writing, that was similar to writing, that made me feel like I am a writer. But what did you actually write today? And if all you can say is, well, I read the latest issue of Writer's Digest, and I, uh, I took a seminar, and I did this, and I did that, but I didn't actually spend any time at the keyboard, but I'm exhausted, and I feel like a writer. Well, you're not, okay? The ones who are going to make it, the 1% out of that 100 people who want that slot are the ones who every single day of their life can say, I wrote today. I always say, I occasionally teach uh, creative writing, and I always say to my students, if you can think of anything you would rather do than write science fiction, do that instead, because everything is easier than writing science fiction or writing any kind of stuff for a living. I can't think of anything that would make me want to get up out of bed in the morning except writing science fiction. And so I absolutely adore my life. I am delighted with the degree of material success I've had, but if I didn't have it, I would be quite happy to be eating, you know, craft dinner every day as long as I could still write science fiction. There are people reading my books who don't think of themselves as science fiction readers. This is the great advantage I have of being a Canadian writer. In the States, I'm, I'm a, I sell fine within the science fiction genre. In Canada, I have readers who read my books who never read science fiction, and that's a wonderful position to be in. Because although my books are doing fine, there are, I think, fewer and fewer real science fiction readers every year. Um, we're moving away from a culture that celebrates science or even celebrates learning. Somebody quipped, I heard a quip recently that I thought was spot on, you know, 25 years ago we taught Latin and Greek in our high schools, now we teach remedial English in our universities. The idea that to be intellectual uh, is not a positive thing is very much ingrained in our society. Uh, we use, you know, the derogatory term geek, not just for science fiction fans, but for Bill Gates, the richest man practically in the world, is a geek and somebody to be looked down upon for his braininess. Um, the beauty of the kind of writing I've been able to do here in Canada is that I've been able to expose science fictional ideas to people who wouldn't normally go to the SF section of the bookstore. And I owe that to the bookstore chains and the independent booksellers who have put me up front with the new releases and have not just put me in that SF ghetto. Um, I think science fiction concepts, the idea that science and technology clearly is going to shape what the future is going to be, not just for generations to come, but in our lifetimes, the future is going to be upon us before we know it. Uh, and as Elvin Toffer, the guy who wrote Future Shock in the 70s said, the only preventive medicine for Future Shock is science fiction, is reading science fiction. At Future Shop, we figure, why just tell someone what you want for the holidays when you can show them with this, the new digital camera cell phone from TELUS. Hello? Hey, honey, check your email. Okay. This is what I want for the holidays. At Future Shop, you'll find hundreds of great gifts, like this exclusive gift bundle from TELUS. Future Shop, come see what your future has in store. Looking for a great gift idea? Here are two from Craftsman. Take the screw-out damaged screw remover. Just about everyone has battled with a stripped screw. The screw-out is able to dig in and twist the screw out. It even works on rusted and painted over screws. The Craftsman screw-out, the easy way out, comes with three bits and case for just $29.97. Craftsman makes all kinds of jobs easier. That's why you need the Craftsman Professional AccuCut 3-in-1 Cutter. Its stainless steel blade cuts through tough household materials cleanly and easily. Retract the anvil and it becomes a razor-sharp utility knife, just right for slicing and scoring. Its titanium-coated wire cutter works on most types of wire, too. The AccuCut Combination Cutter is a basic for any home toolbox. Just $29.97. Craftsman makes anything possible. Craftsman at Sears. Call now to order the Craftsman Screw-Out or AccuCut Combination Cutter, only $29.97 each. Call 1-888-607-3277. The truth. We will find him. The obsession. What did you do to her? The miracle. You're gonna have this, babe. And I'm gonna do everything I can to protect her. 
and the X-Files on season 8 on DVD today. How about a little five on one? What five can do, one can do better. Deep Clean Liquid Tide. One capful of Liquid Tide works better than five of the next leading liquid. Deep Clean Liquid Tide beats the other guys clean. One slams five. Deep Clean Liquid Tide. That's one smart clean. Dr. Miranda Gray is an expert at knowing what he's saying until she found herself on the other side. You have to trust me. You can't trust somebody when they think you're crazy. Starts Friday, November 21st. This program contains scenes with coarse language. Viewer discretion is advised. Ideas don't come full-blown, certainly not for a science fiction novel, but not for a mystery novel, not for a poem, not for anything. Except, you know, maybe a limerick might occur to you full-blown in your head. You know, you, see, you suddenly think of the word that rhymes with colonoscopy, and then you've got the limerick, right? But that's it. Except for something that short, ideas are incremental. And what seems a barrier to people is, wow, I read that book, and it was amazing how it all fell together, and what a great central concept at the core of it, and how did he ever get this idea to work with that idea? And the answer is, it's, it's little bits and pieces of things that you accrete over time. Um, all I know when I sit down to write a book is the most general statement of the theme of the book. And I mean theme even more broadly than I'll talk about it with, with my, the group I'm working with later in the week. Um, when I wrote Illegal Alien, the one I referred to, I said I wanted to write a courtroom drama with an extraterrestrial defendant. That's all I had when I sat down to start working on it. And then I spent four months doing research for me, and I think for anybody who, who writes stuff that isn't 100% autobiographical, research is incredibly not only important for the verisimilitude, for making the work seem real, but is also important as the fount of ideas. Um, when people ask me, where do you get your ideas, I want to ask, what was the last piece of nonfiction that you read? I read voraciously in nonfiction, far more nonfiction than I read fiction, and in all kinds of topics. Obviously, because I'm a science fiction writer, I read in science, but I also read in philosophy and politics, and you name it, and look for things. My sole question as a writer when I'm reading is, is there some interesting way to dramatize this point? If I'm reading something in nonfiction, is there some way to wrap this up in a character and leave people with an emotional response to this otherwise dry idea? And, you know, you'll read a hundred ideas, but the answer is no. There's nothing you can do about this particular aspect of politics or that particular aspect of the stock market and make it exciting. And then you'll stumble across something and say, wow, that would be a great little bit of an idea. And you gather these up over a course of, for me, a course of many months or even years in building a novel. And at the end, uh, when the question is, where do you get your ideas, it's as if there were one per novel and somehow it comes full blown. The answer is, every novel, every creative work is just everything that's interested you and that you've thought of that's interesting in the year or two that you've been working on that book. And the, the ideas develop from all kinds of little pieces put together. And the most interesting thing for me in fiction writing is juxtaposition, is putting two normally separate things side by side. And you can see that throughout. I mean, uh, one example I often use when I'm t uh, teaching science fiction writing has nothing to do with science fiction. It's the TV series All in the Family, because I think it was a brilliant creation on a conceptual level. It was the juxtaposition of the blue-collar, uh, loudmouth, right-wing bigot and the white-collar, loudmouth, left-wing uh, reactionary who was, you know, absolutely going to butt heads with the guy. Two guys who would do everything they could in real life to avoid each other being put together and out of putting two disparate things together, you get something. If there was a juxtaposition in the legal alien, it was the idea that a courtroom drama would have a defendant who had never seen Perry Mason, who had never had any encounter with our legal system, who didn't even know anything about Earth, being put on trial for murder. And once you take two things, put them together, start adding other things, the ideas just accrete from that. But if they came full blown, I would be amazed if I woke up one morning and said, here's a novel. It's never happened to me yet, 15 novels down the road. And I don't expect it ever will happen to me.
in the long run, if there's any value to what I'm doing, it's when I'm preaching to the not already converted about the power of science and technology and the rational thought processes that underlie science fiction. Uh, and to be able to have that audience here in Canada means the world to me. It has been absolutely fabulous. I love thinking about what if and the way things might turn out. Uh, in fact, it, it, I can't not do that. I'm constantly going, well, if this goes on or if that continues or if we don't do something about this, where are we going to end up? You know, before I was a science fiction writer, in the 80s I made my living writing uh, nonfiction for magazines and newspapers, and I did a lot of personal finance stuff. And that seems a bizarre thing for a guy to write about, you know, RRSPs and mortgages and also write about spaceships and aliens. But personal finance is all about planning. It's all about what if. So the extrapolative sense permeates every part of my life. But in science fiction in particular, I, I do think of myself as uh, being kindred to Ray Bradbury a little bit, who says uh, his job is preventing the future. There's a, a public perception that science fiction is about predicting the future, and that the good science fiction writers from the, let's say, the 50s were the ones that predicted we would land on the moon in 1969, and the bad ones are the ones who said we'd do it in 1970. That's ridiculous. It's an incredibly simplistic way of looking at it. Uh, the job of the science fiction writer is to extrapolate all the possible reasonable outcomes. I don't mean reasonable in terms of you'd like to have them, but realistic, plausible outcomes of the things we are doing today present that smorgasbord as a range of fictional possibilities so that the world can choose which one they really want. So if I write a story that shows, as I did say, Factoring Humanity, one of my novels, that may be creating artificial intelligence, really thinking computers that can outthink us, might not be the best idea. The worst thing that could happen to me is for my story to come true. The best thing is for my story, along with the works of my colleagues or saying similar things, uh, would be for it to prevent us from ever making computers that can outthink us. Uh, because we will probably end up being, you know, their servants, their slaves are just dismissed as irrelevant by them. Um, so science fiction, yes, I love to extrapolate, but I don't predict. I extrapolate and say, hey, you can do whatever you want, but if you do this, these are the logical consequences down the road. And all I want to do is open your eyes to them. Science fiction is science, but it's also fiction. And which means it's about ideas, and it's also about characters. And there are different kinds of science fiction writers. There are those who start with a character and then dress it up in a science fictional setting. And there are those who start with an idea and try to find the character that best dramatizes what's at the heart of that idea. I'm in that latter camp. I start off with the concepts that I want to talk about, but I realize that no one is going to be interested in an abstraction. Nobody cares about just an idea or just a, uh, uh, a formula or, a, or an extrapolation. What they do care about is how that's going to affect human beings. And so I always try to find the human being I can put at the center of the drama who most is most discommoded, most put out by what I'm writing about. I did a novel called Friendship about genetics, and there's lots of as the New York Times said, page after page of bold scientific extrapolation. That's true, there is that. There's also at the heart of it, the story of a character, a human being, a man named Pierre from Montreal, who discovers as an adult that he carries the gene for Huntington's disease, which will ultimately kill him. And how does, now that we have this ability, as we do today, to test for all kinds of diseases, but can't do anything about them except say, yeah, you're going to get Alzheimer's, and you're going to have a stroke, and you're going to have a heart attack, and you're going to get testicular cancer, and you're going to get Huntington's disease, and you're going to get diabetes, and, uh, you know, you can give them the whole laundry list. But, no, we can't cure any of those. Sorry about that, but here's what you got to look forward to. We're at that situation, and to be able to talk about that situation in fictional terms, you have to wrap it up in a human story. So... I always try to say that my motto as a science fiction writer is to combine the intimately human with the grandly cosmic. Find the big SF idea, but make it so human that people who didn't think they cared about science, 
will care about my character. If you aged as fast as your large breed dog, by five, your knees might not bend so easily. By seven, your joints could really slow you down. Big dogs are up to eight times more likely to develop joint issues. So feed them Iams large breed formulas. They help minimize joint stress by promoting an ideal body condition to keep big dogs active for longer. Change the way your large breed dog ages. Forget dog years. Live in Iams years. Iams, good for life. How about a little five on one? What five can do, one can do better. Deep Clean Liquid Tide. One capful of Liquid Tide works better than five of the next leading liquid. Deep Clean Liquid Tide beats the other guys clean. One lamb five. Deep Clean Liquid Tide. That's one smart clean. Smart and use your air miles card to get everything from home stuff to gift certificates. If you want it, it's yours. Introducing the Mr. Clean Clean Mop. This new all-in-one mop blasts through dirt and grime and cleans virtually all your floors to a shine. Try the mop that sweeps it clean from the man you know and love, Mr. Clean. Much music, Big Johnny Two Dates is here. Feature Kate's Addiction, Wendell's Grace, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Simple Plan, Top 41, AFI, Blanket Bar, All American Reject, Sam Rock, Queens of the Stone Age, Nickelback, Not by Joy, Big Johnny Two Dates, Indoors, November 18th. This program contains scenes with coarse language. Viewer discretion is advised. of my second novel, Farseer. This is the original oil painting. The character here is Aspan, and he is the Galileo equivalent on his world. What he's discovered is the astronomical truth of the planet he lives on. And I think he kind of has been a model for a lot of my characters. He's a guy who comes up against uh, outlandish or outrageous situations, but keeps his rationality and his scientific cool about him when everybody else is going nuts and figures out what really is going on. In the context of this story, um, the world that these guys live on is a moon orbiting around a Jupiter-like planet. You see this here? This is a Jupiter-like planet. They're one of the moons that orbits around it. There's another little moon right there. And they live on a continent that's always on the far side of the moon so that they've never, they never see the planet they orbit around. Well, when their sailors, their uh, Galileo and well, their Columbus-type characters, start sailing around, they see this huge thing rising out of the waters, and naturally enough, they think of it as God. Aspen is the guy who comes around and realizes that it's not God at all. It's a natural, understandable scientific phenomenon. And I suppose if there's a theme in my work, it's that there's nothing, not even the study of God, that is beyond the scope of rational, dispassionate, scientific, intellectual inquiry. Well, replied Mary, not everyone on this earth, that is, everybody believes in an afterlife. Do the majority, asked the Neanderthal. Well, yes, I guess so. Do you? Mary frowned, thinking, yes, I suppose I do. Based on what evidence, asked Ponter. The tone of his Neanderthal words was neutral. He wasn't trying to be derisive. Well, they say that, Mary trailed off. Why did she believe it? She was a scientist, a rationalist, a, a logical thinker. But, of course, her religious indoctrination had occurred long before she'd been trained in biology. Finally, she shrugged a little, knowing her answer would be inadequate. It's in the Bible, the translator bleeped. The Bible, repeated Mary. Scriptures, bleep. Holy text, bleep. A revered book of moral teaching. The first part of it is shared by my people, called Christians, and by another major religion, the Jews. The second part is only believed in by Christians. Why? asked Ponter. Uh, what happens in the second part? It tells the story of Jesus, the Son of God. Ah, yes, that man on the television spoke of him. So, so this creator of the universe somehow had a, a human son? Was God human then? No, 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 
he's incorporeal, without a body, then how could he? Jesus' mother was human, the Virgin Mary. She paused. In a roundabout way, I'm named after her. Ponter shook his head slightly. Sorry, my translator has been doing an admirable job, but clearly is failing here. My translator interpreted something you said as meaning one who has never had sexual intercourse. A virgin, said Mary, yes. But how can a virgin be a mother, asked Ponter. That is another oxymoron. Jesus was conceived without intercourse. God sort of planted him in her womb. And this other faction, Jews, you said, rejects this story? Yes. They seem less credulous, shall we say. Of all the professions in the world that are solo professions that you do on your own, there is none for which you succeed or fail so publicly as a writer. You can be a good or bad plumber or a good or bad carpenter, and only the immediate clients you have will know about it. But if you're a, a good or bad writer, once you are published, you become part of public domain. Your work may not, but you do, and people will comment on your work. And you have to, unlike any other artist or athlete or anything like that, you have to stand or fall on it on your own. What you are doing is writing, uh, in writing, is putting parts of yourself on the printed page. And I've, I've been an editor before, and I know the standard conceit from editors is when they reject something, that we're not rejecting you, rejecting pieces of paper that you have made marks on. Well, in fact, of course, they really are rejecting you if you're any kind of serious writer, because those pieces of paper you put marks on are as much a reflection of you as if it was a perfect mirror uh, or a perfect photograph of yourself that you'd handed in. You are being rejected, and it's hard to take. Science fiction writers tended to be early adopters of high technology, so I've been computerized as a writer since 1983. Um, and on the internet since 1984, before anybody had even heard of the internet outside of small circles. But I'm fully a computerized writer. And I think I'm lucky enough that I became a computerized writer early enough in my career, when I was 23, to really embrace writing on computer in a way that some of my older colleagues don't. They think of the computer as a fancy electric typewriter. And they start at the beginning, and they go through to the end, and they just don't have to worry about typos. That's what the computer does for them. I write all over the document. I may start by writing a scene in the middle of the story, and then I might write a scene at the end of the story. And only very late in the process do I go back and write the beginning, after I realize what the right beginning should be. I'm in no way a linear writer. And people who came to computers after years of doing it at a typewriter never break from that, start at page one and go to page 400 or whatever it is for your novel. I go all over the map and it, the technology makes that possible for me to do that. And I think it makes for ultimately a more layered and complex mosaic of a book. I've never had a job except being a writer. Uh, so I've been a full-time freelance writer since 1983. Uh, I did not make a lot of money for the first five years that I was writing and that was writing nonfiction. I was doing press releases and newsletters plus the personal finance articles I used to write for the Financial Times, Financial Post, and for Report on Business in the Globe and Mail, things like that. Uh, I did all that kind of stuff uh, to make ends meet. By the late 80s, by about 88, I was making a good living as a nonfiction writer. And that was kind of a trap because I was about to turn 30. I turned 30 in 1990. And I'd always meant to be a science fiction writer, always. And yet, science fiction, especially early in one's career, pays very poorly. I had to pay rent, I had to buy groceries, and all this kind of stuff. So I found myself having done more than five years of writing that wasn't really science fiction. I mean, it, it wasn't at all science fiction, but I was finally making a good living as a writer. And I said to my wife in 1988, when I was 28 and she was 30, I said, I'm going to be 30 soon, and i got to stop doing this, even though I'm making, you know, at that time, I, uh, I was the breadwinner, I was making more money in the house than she was. Uh, through the nonfiction, I'm not going to be happy if I don't just stop doing this and try and write novels. So from 88 to 90, I brought in virtually no money to our household. I was trying to write novels. From 90, when my first book came out, to 95, I was making your typical starving writer kind of money. And then in 96, I won the, the top prize in my field, the Nebula Award from the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. And as my own editor said to me at the banquet, at the, which was aboard the Queen Mary, I mean, a wonderful place to have the ceremony,
Instead, you've gone overnight from being a promising newcomer to an established bankable name by winning this prize. And certainly, my wife and my economic horizons broadened enormously. Um, I would say from 1996 on, I've been making a good, comfortable, uh, you know, upper middle class living. And I'm, that's fine. I'm content with it. But I would be doing it even if I wasn't making a good living at it. Horsepower Acura MDX. Power and refinement living in perfect harmony. I'm back by T3 now on DVD. Terminator versus Terminator. Only one will be left standing with revealing new footage by Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines now on DVD. It is time. Leave even sports stuff fresh air clean with Febreze every day. Sweep away odors and leave the carpet fresh air clean with Febreze every day. The makeover for an award show is a long process. Updos and curly things, straightening irons, blow dryers. It only lasts for one night. It really does a number on my hair. So any little bit helps, like Pantene. It's a makeover that lasts. I think my hair proves it. It's shiny, soft. I think it looks great. I don't think anybody does hair better than Pantene. That is my true self, a red carpet girl. That's who I really am. Not. <laughs> Young. This couple's playing Mad Gab. Hey. Will Young marry him? Will you, mar Will you marry me? Yeah. The game where it's not what you say, it's what you hear. This program contains scenes with coarse language. Viewer discretion is advised. I'd sold a few short stories before I wrote my first novel, and on the strength of those, I was able to land a literary agent in New York City, who represented me for about five years, and we're still friends, he's a fine guy, uh, but we reached a point where I needed a different agent, and uh, I went and I actually got Stephen King's agent, Ralph Vichinazza, who is the top agent in the world in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. He's got King and horror, he's got uh, the estate of Isaac Asimov, uh, Robert Silverberg, all the biggest names in science fiction. And uh, at the time he took me on, he hadn't taken on a new author in several years. But he did take me on. I, at the, I was just up for the nebula at that point, and he was intrigued. He took me on, and uh, he looks after selling my works, not just in the United States and Canada, but uh, his great strength as an agent is international sales. And I'm published in Bulgaria and Poland and Russia and Japan and Spain and France and uh, China and uh, uh, Italy, all over the world. Um, and about half my income, in fact, comes from non-English language editions of my books, scattered uh, hither and yon over the planet. Ralph takes care of selling my books, finding the publishers, and negotiating the contracts. There still is a lot of business-related stuff, and I am, in fact, incorporated, sfwriter.com, Inc. That's my company. Uh, and uh, I employ my wife full-time as my salaried assistant. Her job is to look after all the things that are business related to my science fiction career that aren't the actual writing. So uh, she's the one who checks over the contracts that Ralph sends along. She's the one who does the accounting, does the proofreading, um, gets all the stuff shipped off in the mail, looks after our, we've got an extensive website at sfwriter.com that she looks after. Uh, all because it would be nonsensical for me to be doing anything except writing science fiction, is that I'm now at the stage of my career where there's nothing I can do, not teach, not broadcast, not lecture, not anything that would pay me more than writing the science fiction does. I am very much a business-oriented writer, and it comes back to having written nonfiction about business and having a father who was a, a professional economist before that. 
Um, and I decry writers who don't take the business aspect seriously, who don't understand contracts or royalty statements or break points or reserves against returns or any of the terms that you find in publishing contracts that are designed, in fact, to baffle writers. And I spent some time as president of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, which is a professional association for people in my industry, because I care about the business issues. Um, it astonishes me when writers who are starving in garrets uh, continue to starve in garrets in ignorance. They refuse to become savvy about promoting themselves and promoting their work and even understanding how much their work is really worth in the marketplace. That's just nuts, and yet so many writers do that. They say, oh, I'm an artist, pure and simple. I can't sully my hands with business. Well, when you get uh, Treasurer Printer's Inc. on your fingers, it's worth sullying your hands. So you should uh, get involved with the business aspect. Every writer should. What you write and what I write are always going to be apples and oranges. There's no way to even compare which one is, is which. So why should I or anybody in uh, any professional writer in any field fear or be unsupportive of anybody who wants to get in. There's no reason for it because they're not directly competing with you in terms of what they produce. Um, in terms of science fiction as a genre, most people who have never read science fiction have a very narrow idea of what the genre is about and they tend to think of it as being uh, Star Wars. Many of my colleagues would love to hunt down and kill George Lucas because he completely confused the public about what science fiction is all about. Uh, in terms of writing in science fiction, I think it's much wider as a genre than any of the other commercial genres. Horror, mystery, romance, western, all have much more restrictive rules about what you can write, about what constitutes a story or acceptable class of storytelling. In science fiction, you can be as stylistically inventive as you want to be. You can be as politically um, left or right as you want to be. You can be as uh, satiric or as serious as you want to be. There really are no barriers except that you write something that has a philosophical underpinning that makes it in some way commentary on our world today without being directly about our world today. <laughs> I was born in 1960, and this is Thunderbirds. This is my childhood. It's now out on DVD. Some of my first exposure to science fiction were from these British puppet shows for kids. I absolutely adored them. But the big influence in my life wasn't this stuff. It was this. It was Star Trek. I was six years old when Star Trek was first on in first-run television, and I only rarely got to see it because it was on after my bedtime. But I saw it occasionally. I made models of the Enterprise out of Lego, and they're enterprise models all over the apartment. This is where I real, realized, even as a kid, that science fiction was going to be an important part of my creative life, because they did stuff on Star Trek that was social commentary. Growing up in the 60s was the backdrop of the Vietnam War and the backdrop of the assassination of Martin Luther King. All that stuff was my childhood. And here was a show that was talking about race relations and was talking about the stupidity of the kind of war that was going on in Southeast Asia. Yes, it's action adventure, but it also was real social commentary. And I realized that science fiction, because of Star Trek, even as a kid, the original Star Trek made me realize that science fiction could be something important. And when I went on to do my own book, that's the cover of one of my British editions there, that was exactly what I wanted to bring to it, the excitement of uh, the, the stuff I'd seen on TV, but with the co social commentary and thoughtfulness, just as my novels, even if they're set in the future, are about the years in which they were set. They're comments on reality. Science fiction, despite all the trappings, is very much a contemporary form of literature commenting on reality. Because every writer I know uh, who's any good suffers from the imposter syndrome. The only guys who are confident and cocky are the ones who are hacks. It's, oh yeah, I can just turn that out in a few days. Anybody who's got ambition in any field of writing, poetry, mainstream fiction, science fiction, history, it doesn't matter, is scared when they're halfway through a work that they never had any talent to begin with and people are finally going to discover it with this particular uh, travesty that they're currently producing. And so, in some ways, it seems vain to have a, a, a trophy shelf in my office but there are times when I got to go there and look at it and just remind myself you did it before you can do it again keep going Rob
You're not different when you're at Ronald McDonald House. You don't have to explain. Ronald McDonald House provides a home away from home for families with children receiving hospital treatment for life-threatening illnesses. Please visit McDonald's and purchase a Ronald McDonald finger puppet. All profits will be donated to Ronald McDonald House in support of World Children's Day. You're all living together, and it's like family. Did you ever notice how kids have the perfect hair color? With all these highlights and dimensions? Don't you wish they could bottle this? Well, check out Nice and Easy. Nice and Easy with built-in highlights. Instead of flat, matte hair color, get color with highlights, dimension, natural variations, strand to strand. From matte to magical. Now this perfect color is mine. Nice and Easy with built-in highlights. Claro, color wonderful. Join the samurai, the men who defied a nation. It is the end of the samurai. The warriors start over. Who became legend. Tom Cruise, the last samurai. Starts Friday, December 5th. No. Birthday. No. Company? Yeah. Company. So, where is everyone? <laughs> now you don't need an occasion to have a roast. You just need 10 minutes. New Maple Leaf Roast. Real hand trim cuts of seasoned beef, pork, or turkey. Slow cooked, so you just heat them up. Maple Leaf. We take care. This program contains scenes with coarse language. Viewer discretion is advised. Every writer has a humilometer, which is constantly doing things like this. When you encounter humiliating situations that you just, you can't believe that you've encountered this situation, but it really has happened to you, and you have to learn to roll with this. A friend of mine, I wish it, I could say it was me, because it would be a better story, but it isn't. A friend of mine named Mark Garland, who's a writer in the States, did a signing at a B. Dalton's, which is one of the bookstore chains in the United States. And he signed for two hours, and he sold a ton of books for the bookstore, and at the end of the signing, he said, to the store manager, can I use the bathroom? And the manager said, well, that's for employees only. And he had to go out in the mall <laughs> to find a place to relieve himself. The humilimeter was going pretty high, even at a successful book signing event. At a less successful book signing event where you sit there and you can hear the crickets chirping, and there's nobody. That also causes the humilimeter to go up. So the irony is that writers get told all the time that they're arrogant because they do develop a thick skin and perhaps they aren't the most sensitive people to the guy who comes up to them and says, as somebody did to me, here's another humilimeter, uh, I was at a signing in Vancouver where a guy waited in, laid in wait for me, was there when I arrived, and I arrived 20 minutes early, and he said, Mr. Sawyer, I just wanted to tell you, I, and I counted them, there were five, hated, 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 calculating God, which was my most recent novel at that time, to which I replied, well, fuck you, because <laughs> what other reply could there possibly be? There <laughs> it wasn't like I was going to give him his money back, <laughs> especially since I had only gotten 10% of his money. You'd have to go see my publisher to get the other 90%, or the bookstore, or whoever had the rest of the money. It wasn't me. So there are people who think that because you're an author, you don't have feelings, and they can say whatever you want. they want to say to you, and you develop this... Um, veneer that sometimes is taken as arrogance on the part of other people. Uh, but it isn't. I think every writer I know is incredibly insecure, and they go home at night after they've strutted around and said, well, fuck you, to people. They go home at night and then crawl up into these little fetal balls and just lie there and hope that sleep will take them eventually. I get a fair number of fan letters inquiring about my health because I've had characters die of cancer. And I've had characters die of Huntington's disease, and all sorts of horrible things have happened to my characters. And they say, my God, you write so convincingly about people who have a, a terminal illness. Are you okay? And the answer is, I'm fine. Thanks for asking. I appreciate it. But I'm fine. I'm absolutely fine. Um, I write autobiographically, but I also write biographically. 
That is, I write about my friends and my family and all sorts of people who surround me. And it's um, an error for a reader to say, oh, so this is what's going on in Rob's marriage, or oh, that's what's going on with uh, Rob's relationship with his parents. Because it might just as easily be uh, my best friend's relationship with his parents that I've stolen. Uh, my wife is always mad at me in restaurants because we'll be eating a dinner and the couple behind us will be having a fight. And I'm like, well, this is good. You know, I'm taking notes, right? So a writer is always a, uh, taking everything from the people around them and disguising the details so that people hopefully don't recognize themselves. Uh, good writing always seems autobiographical. It always seems as if, wow, he really lived through that or he couldn't possibly have written about it so realistically. But in fact, not just for me as a science fiction writer, but for all kinds of writers. If we really did live through the incredible highs and lows and tragedies and triumphs that our characters do, we'd be in rubber rooms. We would just be, you know, uh, completely unable to deal with the real world. So there is some autobiographical stuff in my work, but I don't think anybody but me, and sometimes not even my wife, recognizes what is autobiographical and what I borrowed from other people. One of the great joys, and a science fiction writer, of course, is about exploring strange new worlds. One of the great joys of my job is getting to travel all over the world. Uh, I've been to Japan twice recently, once to be a distinguished Canadian speaker at the Canadian Embassy in Tokyo, which just, you know, blew my mind because the other author they had as a distinguished Canadian was Margaret Atwood. You know, this was just astonishing. Um, I've been to Spain, I've been to uh, Mexico, I've been to all parts of Western Europe, um, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, yes, I get to travel a great deal because of my job, because my books are published internationally, uh, and it's just an absolute treat. There's something, you know, some people say, well, science fiction, it translates easily because it's not really about the real world. That may be true of some kinds of science fiction. But my stuff is firmly grounded in the here and now, almost all set in the present day or the very near future, and usually in Canada of the present day or very near future. And I'm delighted that when I write about Toronto, that people in Spain or Tokyo or Mexico City are reading and understanding Toronto because I'm exporting a little bit of the view of how I see this, this great country of ours of Canada. In fact, I get more writing done when I'm away from home than I do when I'm at home. Uh, it's nice to be a successful writer, but being a successful writer means you get asked to give talks, to do bookstore signings, uh, to do media appearances, uh, to do teaching, all kinds of stuff that just impinges on your writing time. When my wife and I travel, uh, we often will take a car trip, even though it would be much faster to fly, because she'll drive the car and I'll sit in the passenger seat with my laptop and get, you know, six uninterrupted hours where the phone isn't ringing, where there's nothing to draw me away from the keyboard and I'll get an enormous amount done. We also just leave Toronto a fair bit and go, uh, my family has a vacation home in upstate New York on the side of a lake, we go there, uh, we rent cottages, we go all kinds of places to just get away from the distraction and get the writing done. But even when I'm traveling on book tour, as I, I just come back from a book tour, um, I've always got a notebook computer with me and I'm always doing work uh, and enjoy it a great deal. It's wonderful to be able to have a job that's 100% portable, that I can go anywhere in the world and get work done and not feel guilty. Oh, here I am, you know, in Barcelona and I really should be, uh, you know, back home working. No, if I feel I got to do some work, I open up the computer and get some work done in Barcelona. It's been building up for months. The frustration of calcium buildup in your shower head. Get it clean with CLR, the industrial strength cleaner that takes on the toughest jobs around your house. CLR dissolves rust, lime, and calcium buildup easily without scrubbing. For everything from stucco and brick to the dishwasher. You know CLR for its legendary strength, but CLR works safely too for tough stains in the house like buildup in both the coffee maker and coffee pot, or deposits in the humidifier. 
CLR gets rid of rust and stains in the washing machine. So when you wash, your clothes come out clean. So why buy a new showerhead when your old showerhead works just like new with CLR? Skip the rubbing and scrubbing. Say goodbye to buildup. No house should be without CLR. CLR leaves nothing behind. At participating Canadian Tire, Home Hardware, Safeway, Shoppers Drug Mart, Rona Revy, Home and Garden, Co-op, Pro Hardware A's, True Value Hardware VNS, Home Hardware Building Centers, Home Depot, and Zellers. Whoa, roast. Oh, I must have forgotten something. Anniversary? No. Birthday? No. Company? Yeah, company. So, where is everyone? Now you don't need an occasion to have a roast. You just need 10 minutes. New Maple Leaf Roast. Real hand trim cuts of seasoned beef, pork, or turkey. Slow cooked, so you just heat them up. Maple Leaf. We take care. You're not different when you're at Ronald McDonald House. You don't have to explain. Ronald McDonald House provides a home away from home for families with children receiving hospital treatment for life-threatening illnesses. Please visit McDonald's and purchase the Ronald McDonald Finger Puppet. All profits will be donated to Ronald McDonald House in support of World Children's Day. You're all living together, and it's like family. This program contains scenes with coarse language. Viewer discretion is advised. Despite all my comments about loving to write, like many a writer, I'm a great procrastinator. So that unless I have a reason that I have to start writing first thing in the morning, like my wife and I have an evening engagement, I will put off actually getting to the keyboard to maybe four in the afternoon. I'll get up, I'll putter around, I'll do my email, I'll read just for pleasure, because that's an important part of being a writer, is reading other people's material. And then eventually, I will make it to the keyboard and sit down and do the work. I do love doing the work. But it is work. Like any job in life, almost anything else is more interesting than the actual work. Um, I love it, but I put it off in the day till about four, and I may write, if I'm, I set myself a word count, 2,000 words a day, which is about eight double-spaced manuscript pages. If I can, when I'm cooking, when I'm hot, I can do that in 90 minutes. And when I'm not, it can take me 14 hours. Well, whatever it takes. If it takes 14 hours and I'm up to three in the morning, I'm up to 3 in the morning. But if I can get it done in 90 minutes, then the rest of the time is mine. That's my motivator. If I get my work done, I've got free time, which may be going to read some science fiction instead of writing it, or some classic fiction, some great literature, or going to see a play. My wife and I like live theater a great deal. But it's, uh, I do my work because it's the work that I love, but it is still work. Everybody, no matter what you do for a living, you've had this experience. You've seen a pop culture representation of what you do. Whether you're a teacher, you're a stockbroker, you're a doctor, you're that plumbing guy I keep talking about. You watch it on TV or you read it in a book and you see it in a movie. You say, it's not like that. I wish somebody had asked me, right? I would have told them what it's really like to do that. Everybody in the world has had that experience, that frustration. And that's your key as a writer to getting into any door you want to have open. I have never in 20 years now as a professional writer and 15 novels under my belt, uh, never had anybody ever say no, no matter who they were, when I called them up and said, I'm doing a novel in which X, Y, and Z happens, and I know you're uh, an expert on this, and I want to get it right. They're chuffed, they're excited, oh wow, you know, he's come to me, no matter who they are, and they're anxious to help you with the material. You have to have done your basic homework beforehand. It's unfair and irritating to go to a policeman and say, now, now how does this whole policing thing work, right? But if you go in there and say, now I don't understand what happens between the period where the, uh, the uh, um, Crown Attorney has laid the charge and the period in which uh, the defense attorney is assigned here. What can I? What can you do in the interrogations? Oh well, let me tell you. You know, we have all these ways that we get information out of them, even when we're not supposed to, or whatever. Right? That kind of t uh, targeted question. And I put this to the test most. Again, I don't know why I keep coming back to Illegal Alien because it's hardly my favorite novel, but it's apropos here. Um, when I was doing Illegal Alien, which was a courtroom drama set in Los Angeles, and I had to contact lawyers in L.A who would bill routinely at three or four hundred dollars US an hour and say, you know, will you take 15 or 20 hours to read my book and comment on it in manuscript? 
every one of them said yes. Every single one that I asked said yes, because they wanted to make sure that at least some small portion of the pop culture world really understood what they went through. Science fiction is usually thought of as being about the far future, but I have an equal fascination with the ancient past as I have with the far future. This is a fossil fern, 300 million years old from central Pennsylvania, uh, and it, I adore it because, A, it's simply because it's beautiful. It is a work of art in and of itself. B, because of its, uh, this, this rock is a time machine. We're seeing back 300 million years to what a particular life form looked like at that particular time. It's a permanent mark on a permanent substance. I'm a big believer in printed books. I like reading electronic books, but I want my books printed in bound form. And this kind of thing that we have here is, is, a, is a book. This is literally uh, a, a hardcover or a hardback book out of history, out of 300 million years ago that people are still reading and enjoying today. It's the perfect metaphor for what a writer tries to create. Well, evolution says that our lives are all about getting our genes to survive to the next generation. I don't have any kids. My wife and I chose not to have kids, and that makes no evolutionary sense. In terms of Darwin's survival of the fittest, I am by definition completely unfit because my genes are not being passed on. Well, I like to say I'm more interested in my memes than my genes. Memes is a, a word Richard Dawkins, a British uh, geneticist, coined to refer to ideas that propagate and survive the way genetic material does. Um, the happy face logo from the 70s was a meme. It went everywhere and reproduced billions of times. I like to think the ideas, the memes in my books, are going to survive after me, just as this fossil of this fern, which is long extinct, survived long after the fern itself was gone. It's going to pique your curiosity. Hyperspace Weekly, your weekly roundup of what's new in sci-fi and fantasy entertainment. The real story, as fantastic as it may be. Make the jump to hyperspace. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Hyperspace Weekly, our seven-day roundup of events in the worlds of sci-fi and fantasy entertainment. On today's program, we'll take a look at the cockamamie world of Dr. Seuss with the new Cat in the Hat film starring Mike Myers. We'll tell you what's new on the comic and toy and video shows, and even throw in a couple of prize-winning authors. Oh, and for those of you who haven't seen it yet, we'll try and get the new Harry Potter trailer on, so I'll see you inside after a very danceable intro. But let's start, as always, with a bit of news for you. Well, it seems Christopher Lee is hobbit-biting mad upon learning the news that he won't be in the last installment of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. The 81-year-old actor who plays Saruman in the first two Lord of the Rings films says he was shocked and mystified by his apparent cut from The Return of the King and says he will boycott the premieres. 
Lee says, the only reason I'm able to say this is because it was on the internet and has been for some days. He signed a confidentiality agreement. I only heard recently. Of course, I am very shocked. That's all I can say. And after being asked if he planned to attend any of the opening night celebrations, Lee snapped back, no. What